welcome to the show, Louise. How are you? Good. Thank you, John. Great to be here. Great. So I think one of the first things we do is uh, share a beverage. Um, it's, I think, around 10 a.m. right now, uh, local time, so probably inappropriate for champagne. Um, so you suggested something else instead, which I'm glad. Um, can you tell me what, what we're drinking today? Oh, we're drinking the, uh, the Twinings <laughs> Lemon and Ginger. I've got the, the bulk pack. <laughs> Uh, so I've got my, my oh, you got your. <laughs> yeah, I've got a single. <laughs> uh, during COVID, it's just you got to have you got to buy bulk. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, but, but no, I've got my, uh, my favorite cup uh, was my grandmother's cup, and that's why I like drinking my tea from. Very fancy. I've I've got a standard. Um, I don't know IKEA or something. I think so. Um, <laughs> you're one step ahead of me. So uh, tell me a bit about like why you like this. Just a um, bit of a refresher without the caffeine or. Well, um, probably two, st- two, two reasons. One of my uh, favourite days I've had in my life was um, I was working on Lizard Island and I went for a snorkel and I'm snor- snorkelling away just off the beach. Have you been to Lizard Island at all before? No, no. It's, it's absolutely stunning. You've got the granite rock and then you've got the, the aqua water and I'm just I'm, I'm, uh, snorkelling away and I look beside me and there's this turtle that's swimming right beside me and it was just one of those moments you just go oh that's amazing so when I got back uh to uh uh to to my unit I um I thought I'm gonna have a nice cup of tea just to celebrate the moment and I never had lemon and ginger tea before and that was my first day of uh having a lemon and ginger tea sitting just you know thinking about that amazing moment and uh and now when I have a lemon and ginger tea I it takes me back (laughs) to that moment it's funny how that works. Like it's the same with smells. It's this uh, associative um, kind of stimulus that gets attached. We kind of use that in marketing a lot. We're trying to uh, behaviorally condition people with certain cues, whether they're smell or flavor or, or a sound or, or words uh, to, to a memory. Um, so yeah, it's interesting how that works. Um, I actually started my, making my own ginger lemon tea. So I slice the ginger, dry it out in the sun or, you know, in a low oven and then uh, yeah. crush it up and um, put lemon myrtle leaves in because they they kind of give the lemony sort of taste without um, mm. having to slice up lemons. And um, it's a good alternative, so you should try that one as well. Yeah, I'm writing that down. <laughs> <laughs> and do you, do you actually boil it or do you put it in the sun? Yeah, I've got a lemon myrtle tree out the back. So, um, And it's funny, lemon myrtle trees were used in World War II by the U.S. Army for the lemon flavorings because citrus was so expensive. Um, the yield uh, in terms of this chemical called l- limonene, uh, which is the main sort of flavoring component of the lemon taste that we all know, um, it's really high. It's like 96% or something in lemon myrtle leaves, So, um, which is really lucrative if you want to distill the oil and use it in flavoring so um that's what they did uh, the americans came to australia <laughs> we started distilling lots of lemon myrtle leaves and they used that on all the lemon lemon flavorings for the uh the army well there you go i have to go to bunnings over the weekend and get myself some lemon myrtle <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's perfect so um really quick uh, intro into to who you are obviously we'll We'll give you a nice bio before the start of this, but um, just in case anyone doesn't know who you are, um, what is it that you do and, and uh, what do you specialize in? Yeah, so um, I, I'm the founder of the Advisory Board Centre, which is the professional body for the um, advisory board uh, profession, um, I guess. So I started the, uh, uh, the Advisory Board Centre three and a half years ago as a professional body um, based on years of research, validation of the market. But, uh, yeah, we're the, we're, the, uh, we're the only global professional body uh, for advisory boards. Uh, it's a very exciting space to be in. Wow. Okay, that's great. And um, your bit of your backstory, like uh, have you always been doing this? Or I mean, I know you somewhat personally and I know you've been in business a long time, but how did you get to this position? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> uh, the, uh, it just it just happened. Uh, you know, I, I started my first business when I was nineteen. Uh, worked in uh, tourism and hotels, and uh, and then uh, did my MBA on the future of human resources, and it's then developed my previous business, which is was around outsourced HR to the small and medium sized business sector. That was back in two thousand, <clears throat> and then I developed. The research institute in 2002 which ended up being a really good move for us because it was around understanding entrepreneurs and what it's like to work for an entrepreneur or a business owner um, and then um, that business it was we were really wanting to scale it so i put together an advisory board 
uh, for that business um, uh, to, to support our strategy and to support me as well to save me from myself basically <laughs> and so we built that we built that business to 135 offices in eight countries in five years and then when i sold that business i just felt so eternally grateful for what that advisory board had done for me both for the business as well as for me personally that um i thought you know if they can do that for me what can it do for other people so everyone in in the advisory board space everyone was just doing their own thing and um it's like everyone's being free-range chickens so there was actually no commonality and a lot of people develop advisory boards and sit on them so i um i spent five years to research test and validate the market um to look at what different advisory structures are what's happening in the consulting sector internationally as well as in Australia and then from that we realised that no one was really looking after or caretaking the advisory board sector and that's when we decided to to develop the advisory board centre as a professional body to build best practice frameworks, have quality people um, uh, working with them, creating a collaborative environment um, and and um, and that's that's kind of where it, where it is today. And so we've got we've got a, a thriving advisory board of community um, across Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, Singapore, um, Shanghai, Tokyo, New York. Um, so it's uh, it's just going from strength to strength, just based on really high quality, sophisticated people who are really humble and really supportive of the business sector that that need it the most. Well, that's great. So it's huh? a bit of a ride. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, yeah. that's great. What you said about saving you from yourself, um, I can definitely relate to that. Um, sometimes you are your own worst enemy in business and um, you need that sort of external perspective uh, to to take you out of your little bubble, I suppose. Um, and that's what uh, attracted me to find out more about what you guys do. So uh, I suppose let's just start with like what is an advisory board and and maybe what isn't it? Right. So, yeah, an advisory board is uh, like a professional way of working with external mentors collaboratively. Um, so it's not like a one-on-one -on -one engagement where you, you know, you engage one consultant and it's linear, it's one, one person. Um, and it's also a collaborative environment where you have different people or mentors or advisors that come from different backgrounds so they're not all the same. So when you have an advisory board, the most common structure, John, is that uh, a business will have an independent certified chair uh, that will establish an advisory board. It generally takes about three months to establish one. Um, I really identify what are the key priorities for that business and then bring in the advisors that are fit for purpose for that particular business. Those advisory board meetings are generally four to six times a year that they meet. Um, and you measure economic impact at the bank at, on an annual basis. So you make sure the advisory board is um, is really on track. But it's a great way to be able to really support uh, the, the, the what's next for, for any business. Um, it's very different okay. to a governance. Yeah. Um, so one thing I see a lot, maybe just in the tech space as well, is um, uh, you see a lot of advisors saying they are advising the startup. Um, but often they're just planted there by like the VC or uh, they've got a member sort of with some kind of equity stake and they call themselves an advisor, but perhaps they aren't. I mean, um, what does advisory boards get confused with? Um, so you've got a very structured process and, and provisions around um, how an advisory board should be run um, with the advisory board center. Um, what do you see is maybe the opposite end of that? Mm. Um, I think there's an important piece here, though. The, the advisory board sector, it's not regulated or legislated. So it can take on a lot of different forms um, to make it fit for the environment that they're in. So a scale-up business, say $1.5 million business, will, may have specific needs that are very different to a corporatized advisory board as an example. So it needs to be able to be flexible to meet the, the, the need of the environment that they're in. So it, it can take a lot of different forms uh, for it. What it is, it's not a governance board. So a governance board is a decision-making model um, and, um, and it's binding. It's binding on the organisation. It's binding on the directors as well without personally liable. Um, an advisory board is more about a problem solving environment where the decision stays with the business owner or the organisation. Um, and it's not the advisors there to be able to say what you should and shouldn't do. It's more about road testing, problem solving. It's a thinking system. And then the decision stays with the business owner or, or the organisation. 
that's why I loved it because I wanted the support with the really fine minds, but I didn't want to lose control of my business or the ability to, be able to make my own decisions. Where it gets into trouble, I think, John, is when people mix the role for multiple reasons where an investor gets involved in, in an advisory board. That's where it becomes problematic and it becomes grey about what 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 is it. Are they becoming shadow directors when when they are an investor as well as sitting on the advisory board at the same time? So there's a lot of situation ethics that really need to be really carefully navigated, and that's why a chair really needs to know what they're doing when they when they're supporting a business to make sure the structure is really um, the the right structure for the needs of the business, and you're not creating um, ethical issues around what that advisory board structure is and what it what's there to do and what it's not there to do. Um, part of that that challenge was uh, for us is when we developed the world's first best practice framework that was released in February this year, uh, which was really good timing with COVID actually, um, is that um, in best practice, people mainly think about best practice standards, which is around process. But the process can really change in an advisory board because of the inherent flexibility is its strength. So when we, when we built the best practice framework, it needed to be principles led, which is around ethics frameworks rather than process led because the process can change means as a sector, it would break because people want to do a lot of different things with it because they can and they should. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, so, so the main thing is around understanding where the, where the boundaries are, um, having ethical frameworks and making sure people don't create shadow directorship issues. Um, around their advisory board structure, that's that's where it gets into trouble. Okay, um, I mean, this is this is an interesting area. I mean, we could talk about this for forever. Um, there's some recent examples with certain business people in the state of Queensland, which was uh, allegedly, uh, you know, uh, had shadow directors acting. I won't mention who, but um, I have heard about that perhaps with that example in mind. Um, mm. And I suppose I've heard some stories as well from the consulting industry where perhaps some conflicts of interest go on between the contract. Um, mm. And that brings me to ask about, you know, what are the other types of external advice that businesses and directors may seek? Um, so talking about sort of product substitutes to, to what you've created with the advisory board center, um, what do you mm -hmm. see a lot of other people doing to seek advice for, for their business? Yeah, there are so many uh, different types of advice and it goes from the spectrum of, you know, informal to formalized. One is not more important than the other though. I, I think what's important is what is the right advisory structure for the situation. An advisory board is not the answer to everything um, and it doesn't replace other other forms. And I, th I think that's really important to, to know because sometimes at the informal level where you've got family and friends who have be been giving you advice since the day you were born um, through to uh, um, peers, peers in business and, and peer networks, which are really the, the socialisation of entrepreneurs and business owners is so important. Uh, through to business networks, which is another the way of people getting advice where it's really opportunistic and get support collaboratively from, from other business owners. Um, uh, that I think that's really important. Um, part. Then you get informal advisory boards. That's where in the past majority of advisory boards have been where a business owner will get together a group of people they might know, they might um, include their, their current professional service providers. They sit around the table, they don't get paid, uh, but they'll just generally talk about business. They kind of fizzle out. But if you have no budget and you're trying to do something, I think good on you for giving it a go. Um, but they're not as impactful long-term or strategic. Then you get the one-on-one -on -one engagement where you get the consultant, the professional services provider, um, a consultant or a mentor um, or a coach. And that's that one-on-one -on -one engagement. That kind of uh, advice is really very project-led or very specialised-led. Where it gets challenged is where business owners look for one person to have the answer for everything. Um, and because uh, an individual gets asked to fill this particular space, that from the goodness of their heart, they'll try and fill it. But may not necessarily be, the, they may not necessarily be the right person to be providing that advice. Um, so that those, that's where it becomes grey around that individual engagement. The next level of advice um, that becomes more formalised is a formalised advisory board um, where where you've got um, understand really what your strategic priorities are and then you build your advisory board structure specifically for that need. Um, 
generally an advisory board group will work together for about three years and then you change them over based on based on what the changing needs of the business are then the most uh, and so the most common structure for an advisory board is five five people, two people internally, two external advisors and a chair. Then the most formal structure is a governance board where it's the serious undertaking of generally around seven people. They meet 10 to 12 times a year. Um, and um, and it really is, um, that's where it's a hot spot at the moment with regards to uh, personal liability, business liability, the decisions that are being made. Um, and you may have seen in the financial review just last week about how they're also being hit with regards to directors and officers insurance. So it's very expensive. Um, so that governance boards, I think, have been so challenged at this time uh, that I'm really looking forward to the advisory board sort of sector supporting governance boards more uh, with the big job that they've got at hand. Yeah, well, um, I think you touched on a good point there in terms of um, there's there's no other time like now to test governance structures and, and advice on businesses and how to adapt to situations. So that's, you know, one of the reasons I really wanted to talk to you yeah. because, um, you know, getting the right advice by professionals who are probably the best to, to provide that advice in a in a way that um, is most effective is, is challenging at the best of times. Um, so I was really interested to hear what, what you're doing there in terms of having a formalized structure and processes in place to, to help mitigate some of that risk, I suppose. Um, so that brings me to like some of the biases and we do this a lot in the marketing and sales sector, um, human biases. Uh, you said saving your, yourself from yourself before uh, in terms of businesses. So um, what do you think are some of the biggest barriers to like effective uh, business decision making? Um, maybe freeing yourself from some of those biases. Mm. Um, it, it, it's an interesting one. So back in 2004, I started to research the why some businesses achieve their strategy and others don't. Um, and one of the key factors was the addiction to making decisions. So we're addicted to making decisions on the run um, at, in the business sector. Um, and so <clears throat> one of the barriers is to be able to, again, save us from ourselves in focusing on problem solving rather than the decision so if you, uh, people uh, bring problem solving and decision making together, whereas I think they're two very different approaches. If you focus on problem solving and the options and really digging deep, um, then the answers generally reveal themselves and it may be different to the kinds of decisions that you would normally make. So creating an environment for problem solving Solving, to think differently or to think things through and not just look at the obvious but look look at a, at a situation, an opportunity or a problem like this rather than like this. It creates space to be able to um, to be able to evaluate the different pathways to be able to achieve your goal. So who does? that problem solving that's the that's the the critical issue um if we're always surrounding ourselves by the people that are always involved in it every day you don't see it i, I suffer from the same thing right so mm -hmm. um uh, by being able to take a step back and have people that are not involved with it every day um but are highly sophisticated people that you deeply respect and have got the thought leadership you you, you um it's not just their experience you're trying to tap into but you're trying to tap into the way that they think uh, you're able to road test, pull things apart and not necessarily agree with each other. Uh, a good problem solving is being able to be able to respectfully challenge each other um, to be able to bring it back together in a new, 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 with a new lens. Instead of rose-coloured glasses, you end up going out with a clear lens. Um, so um, uh, that, that focusing on that problem solving and then removing the decision-making piece away from that and that may be, which is where an advisory board is an example of that, where the advisors are there to problem solve and then to really re review the options and to say, if I was to do it, I would do it this way. Um, uh, the business owner is still separating out and saying, but it's still my decision. I need to own that decision. It's not your decision to make. Um, and that's that's where sometimes the consulting relationship gets challenged, where consultants say, I recommend that you do this. And if a business owner then follows through and implements it and it doesn't work, they say, you told me that I should do that. They don't own that. They don't grow up in that process. So it's about stepping up and owning the, the problem-solving component to then make a really solid decision that you don't go and change your mind. So that's the other, that's the other issue of making decisions on the run is I'm making a half-baked 
that decision and then I'm going to second guess it later on. Um, and then you end up sabotaging yourself because you're not following the course, because you're not strong in the decisions that you make, you're not deliberate um, in those decisions. And I think if you're focusing on problem solving in the first instance, um, it really, it, 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 um, it, you stay the course once you have made a decision. I think that's an interesting point, actually. I've never heard it said that way, separating problem solving from uh, advisory. <laughs> so um, that, that's really good. Uh, sorry, decision making and, and problem solving. Um, I, I suppose you touched on consultants and advisors. I've always wanted to ask you this question um, because a lot of people ask me as well. What is the difference between a consultant and an advisor? Are they, are they the same thing? No, really, really very different things. Um, we, we've actually just um, uh, released a e-learning uh, program around building a portfolio career because we're getting a lot of people now building portfolio careers, which is great. They don't necessarily understand the difference about being a being a an, an advisor or a consultant or a contractor um, 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 or a director, um, and they are really very different things. Um, the consultant is is really someone who who um, uh, their value is what they know and also maybe what project that they they're being involved with. So a lot of consulting roles and you know three to six month type of, of roles and they provide recommendations, right? And so they're saying that what I know is the most important thing and I recommend this to you. And it may be then you get a contractor that may come in and do the piece of work. So so a consultant is different to then a contractor. Uh, con contractors are there to fulfil a particular function. Um, very often those two get mixed up. And so uh, I've had the situation myself where I say, I need a contractor to do a piece of work. They come in and do the piece of work and all they want to do is consult to me. And I think, no, I just want that piece of work done. <laughs> Maybe underneath they always want like, to be consult consulted. Consult to me, do the piece of work. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So being really clear around your brief about what is it you're looking for, even I, I, I suffer from that sometimes, just going to, so be, be clear around that up front. Then the consultant providing recommendations to an advisor, which is about road testing ideas and evaluating options, is is that so that they, um, um, it's kind of the less that you do, the more valuable you become as an advisor because you, you've, you're not there to, to sell a piece of work. Where it gets problematic, though, is when someone is, tries to be an advisor and then sell in a piece of contracting work um, um, or consulting work at the back end. That's where it, sometimes it can work, but sometimes it doesn't. Um, and a lot of business, mainly the business sector, um, uh, find that really challenging because they say, is that advice from you because it's good for my business or is it because you're trying to sell me something? And that lack of, that, that trust gets undermined um, because, you, you, again, you're second-guessing why, you why are you providing that advice to me now? Um, so separating out the role of an advisor to that of, of, a, of a, a consultant or a contractor, I think it's really important from an ethical point of view but also from a trust point of view we we have an ethics framework that we have for the advisory community to really help them navigate those relationships most of the time it's it's important to separate it out but sometimes you've got to look practically at the situation and what is it that i can do to help someone else uh, but it just needs to be navigated very carefully yeah i think that's that's one of the best answers I've ever heard. So that's, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, uh, I suppose um, I'm really interested because I'm sort of nearing that phase in one of my other businesses where um, I might be looking at formalizing some advisory structures. I was looking at consultants and, you know, maybe some, um, yeah. some VCs who have advisory um, positions in there. Um, so pretend that I'm at the sort of stage of my business where I'm looking for external advice um, to really take my business to, you know, quote the next level. Um, you know, yeah. if I was just starting out in this process, um, what should I be knowing beforehand before I go into this um, so I don't make mistakes in, in that decision-making process? Yeah, it, um, it's a very important phase, John. Um, uh, and I'll just take a, maybe a step back to uh, explain the process that we undertake. Um, in the market, before the advisory board centre existed as an independent professional body, when someone looks at saying an advisory structure or an advisory board structure, 
they go immediately to a player. So you're assessing the model or the um, uh, the different options and the person at the same time. So it's a complex decision to make. Um, so two years ago, we developed the advisory con- the advisor concierge brand specifically in, in the market to to bridge the gap between the business needs and the the business community and the advisor community. Um, so the advisor concierge is a process where we would we would sit down, John, and have a chat, talk about where your business is, what your objectives are, um, and then we would uh, reconvene and we would see what options are. The, the key part to exploring what is the right advisory structure is to identify what your priorities are for the next 12 to 18 months. If you know what your top, we, we talk about the top three a lot, um, if you can get clarity around your top three, um, then we can scope out, is an advisory board structure the right approach for you? Is it a mentoring approach? Is it you need investors or do you need specialists to come in or do you need a governance board? Um, it could be different things. Then based on what your top priorities are, um, it would then scope out what are the, the different advisor backgrounds and experience that you need to tap into to solve whatever it is that's what's next for you. Um, no advisory board is the same um, and uh, you've got to be really mindful of that because the needs of a startup to a scale-up is different to a $1.5 to a $10 million business, 10 to 30, 30 to 50 million, 50 to 100 million and 100 million plus. Mm. Then you get corporatized advisory boards, which is another which is another beast altogether. Um, but um, if, if, if you get that clarity around your priorities, then you scope out the backgrounds um, and what that collective group would be, um, then uh, those opportunities, this is what we call an expression of interest that goes out to the advisory community and those advisors, once they understand what your needs are, would apply for that, go straight to the business owner. Um, what's, what's important in all of that is we've we decided strategically and with absolute intent that we would not charge for that service. Um, because 92% of businesses, when they come to us, they say, we know we need something, we don't know what, and we've never had an advisory board before. Um, so um, uh, we don't take percentage fees, rebates, or any kickbacks either out of any arrangement. So we're not, we are Switzerland in that process. So we only want the best for the business sector, and we do that hand on our heart because the business sector, especially the mid-market, needs as much support as it possibly can. Um, and we help the advisory community to stay on their A-game because the advisory community needs that ongoing professional development. They need that credential. They need to be focusing not only what their um, what they know today about their market insight, but they also need the foresight for what's next and stay one, one step ahead to really add value in the advisory board setting. So that's where our key focus and our revenue model comes from is supporting the, the advisory community. The business sector is a service where we can really truly independently evaluate and support them where we don't have any skin in the game um, and uh, to make sure that um, uh, the best interest of the business owner is at heart. Yeah. yeah, I think you touched on a good point there because um, I, I came to um, a couple of your events and, you know, mingled with the uh, the advisors that were in the crowd um, and I was very impressed by the quality and the depth of their knowledge. Um, there's not many people I can talk to at that level um, and there was a whole room full of them. So um, I was kind of really excited and having really great discussions um, and I suppose then I was interested in, okay, well, what are the red flags? If I'm a business wanting to get an advisor, are there any sort of telltale signs that um, are really indicators of like maybe that person isn't a good choice to advise my business and, you know, maybe I should go to a more formalised structure or hire your services, for example, to, to find those people. Um, any telltale signs that you know of? Well, you got to be crystal clear in your own mind what is it that we need. When when business owners, including myself, meet the meet amazing people as advisors, you're like a kid in a lolly shop. You go, oh, I just, I just want everybody. <laughs> I get a bit from you. I get a bit from you. Um, and 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 uh, that 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 can be that can be a problem. So before you actually start meeting advisors, be crystal clear about what your business needs. So when you meet advisors, you are meeting them with purpose, um, and you are meeting them from a sense of 
control about and this is this is I, I know what I'm looking for um, and and then I can assess advisors based on the need of the business um, and that gets the subjective component out of um, selecting advisors a bit like people are quite good in, in selecting employees but not not so discerning when they come to their advisors they go based on recommendation uh, but then maybe not dig any deeper so when you when you listen with purpose you're able to then select the right advisors for the business for what you need today which is why take a step back and focus on what your needs are first take time on that um, and then then you can be really purposeful telltale signs for advisors i think is important making sure that you ask the right questions around not only their experience but um, what they've been involved with in other organizations but what they have personally done um, so some advisors can be talking about we did this and we did that as an organization it's about asking questions about what did you do um, and getting that that absolute experience that they've had skin in the game with because if you take someone on as an advisor that's had this large corporate experience, they may not necessarily have been firsthand in the actual initiatives that they're talking about. They're just talking about it. And they may not know the graveyard that sat behind that decision uh, where, you know, um, business is tough. Um, so so knowing, knowing where that firsthand experience is, I'd say really look at um, how they listen um, and if, if they've um, been briefed prior to meeting you, given some information, what kind of homework have they done? How much have they really intellectually curious about what you're doing? Um, how interested are they in, in your business? Because they need to be a fan. Uh, you can't just sit on an advisory board as a gig. Um, uh, they've got to be really engaged with the business and, and um, be a champion for that business at the same time um, uh, you, as part of the, sorry, part of the just, legacy. Just what you said there, like uh, skin in the game, that's, that's really interesting. And um, when you were just explaining that, it reminded me of that Steve Jobs video, you know, where um, he's uh, making the analogy of uh, any consultants in the room and, um, and they've never eaten the fruit and he talks about a banana i'll, I'll put the uh, youtube link but it's, it's pretty hilarious and i don't want to say anything against consultants because i think like you said they have their place but he did raise uh, a good example of what you just said in terms of um if you haven't owned and uh, dealt with that that initiative over a period of time had skin in the game and and seen it either be successful or unsuccessful and own that for a period of years mm -hmm. um better or for worse mm -hmm. then uh it's a different mm -hmm. level of understanding um so yeah i think that's a that's a great answer yeah and, and it's skin in, skin in the game for what right so you might have an entrepreneur that's that's just gone through what you're about to go through as a business owner they're great but sometimes you need a C-suite executive that really understands transformation or technology or cybersecurity or whatever whatever it is. Um, you might need a technical specialist um, that has skin in the game for that. That's what the business needs are. So you've got to be careful about not being a, a, uh, a generalist in the way that you look at what skin in the game actually, actually means. Um, because entrepreneurs, supporting entrepreneurs can be fantastic, but you could end up having two free-range chickens talking with each other because they love talking about lots of opportunities and things like that. Sometimes you need those that have got skin in the game around business excellence, where's your business case, all those things to keep you grounded as well. So that's why I think um, uh, being really clear about what is it you want from that, those advisors and making sure not only that they've had that experience or that knowledge, but that they you look at the way that they think about the future because none of us have been there. We need to have, I think, different ways of thinking about our businesses in the future. So we don't want everybody to be the same sitting around that table because otherwise we'll just come up with the same decisions. No, that's good. And I think you touch a point on like um, maybe the... Uh, hang on, I'll just wait for this internet. Um, I think you touch on a, a good point about... Um, you know the outcomes versus the output of of activity um how would you let's say we've put an advisory board structure whether it's formalized unformalized in um how do you then reassess at a later time scale has that worked or not like um if you're looking at very long time horizons it's really hard to calculate opportunity cost sometimes um what are your recommendations for yeah. for putting some kind of framework for measurement in place 
Yeah. So um, it, it's really important to measure economic impact um, of an advisory board, um, whether there's an impact or not. Um, um, so the method that, that we developed over eight years is what we call a, a business growth score. So when a chair establishes the, the establishment phase in the advisory board, they do a growth score assessment. It evaluates not only the quantitative um, data about the business performance, but also then um, it puts all the qualitative information about um, the business owner's relationship with their own business. How do you feel about the performance of your business? How, um, what is your satisfaction? Can the business operate without you? Um, your management control systems, all those sorts of things. So it measures those as well and gives it a growth score. Um, and then um, if you do that on a six monthly or an annual basis, you can then measure uh, the impact of that advisory board. But then you can also measure what's next so if our priorities have changed and are different to what they were 12 months ago you can actually see that and then um, evaluate if our priorities have changed what are our top priorities now are our advisors still the right advisors to be able to meet that future challenge because you might need to swap people out um, uh, so it gives you validated evidence around the effectiveness of that advisory board and the effectiveness of your own decisions. So I do, I've got an advisory board for my business um, um, and um, I love and hate my advisory board, right, because if they, they catch me out with something that I don't know about my business, I go, oh, I should have known that. Um, and, um, and, and we have our own growth score as well. And when you, when you measure um, um, uh, economic impact, you can see where you could put pressure points in your business to decrease maybe your result um, of, the, of your business to be able to achieve a bigger result later on. So it helps you to understand where those levers are and how to control that. Um, so um, the business growth score is, is the method that, 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 uh, that we use. Back in 2002, when I started the Research Institute, I realised the biggest HR challenge of any business is the business owner themselves. So if the business owner is not satisfied with their business, that's a major HR challenge, right, for everybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, uh, and, and you can tell when a business owner is, um, if they're in a, in a really positive place with their business, they've got the energy and the drive and the commitment to the next stage. But if they're a victim to their business, it needs to be, it needs to be really un not judged, needs to be understood um, because you can put whatever strategy on a piece of paper, um, but if it's not going to be driven with the right intent um, and the right positive energy that sits behind it, it's always going to be really difficult to, to crack that. And no advisory board is going to be able to support a business owner that's really not deeply engaged with their own business. It's funny um, you mentioned that because obviously I deal with a lot with entrepreneurs and the, the mental strain running a, a business that could be struggling is like unbearable and it sort of cascades down from that point. And, you know, there's this mm -hmm. finite time period when you start a business to your enthusiasm sort of waning if you're not getting that positive reinforcement from the market. And um, you're, you're exactly right there. Um, you know, that that drive can dissipate. And when that happens and it just everything falls on itself and they start sort yeah. of withdrawing from maybe advisory that they may need. Um, so it's, it's an ego check, isn't it? At the same time. Yeah. Look, I think all of us, I have a love hate relationship with my business every day. <laughs> I love it. I hate it. <laughs> same, same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it, it um, and it comes down to you know the importance of having the right collaboration around you, collaboration with your employees, that your suppliers, your 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 customers, and um, it's an ecosystem, and you've got to you're there not just to be there for you, for yourself for your own business, but you've got this ecosystem around you that you that you've got to be able to support. So you've got to get out of your own bubble uh, and get out of your own head. Um, and then sometimes you do need to make those tough decisions. You, you go, you know what, it, it's time to get out. Or in a current situation, there's a lot of compassion that's needed around advisory boards and advisory structures where some businesses are not going to survive this. So how are they going to be able to do that while still saving face and still feeling good about themselves? And, and I think that's, that, that's also um, uh, being, um, you've got to be real, you've got to be genuine anyone in this space to be able to help people make some difficult and support them as they are making difficult decisions in transition. You know, I just thought um, about what you've created. It's, it's a way of judging a business dispassionately while still being a passionate business person. Yeah. Yeah. There's some, um, um, uh, 
business owners sometimes don't enjoy the experience with a consultant because they feel judged, right? Where an advisory board and particularly the chair, it's really important that they're not there in judgment, they're not there to audit the business and say that's right or wrong. They're there to, to understand the need of the business owner. What is it that you want from this business and how can we help you? Sure, you make some decisions that could sometimes think that was a great decision but it was actually pretty dumb, um, that, um, uh, that you've got people that will there say, okay, well, yeah, that's pretty tricky. What are you going to do about it? Um, yep. and help them navigate that. So the difference between judgment versus understanding is a big point of difference between being a consultant and having an advisory board. Yeah, yeah, look if I feel like I'm being judged, sorry, if I feel like I'm being judged by my advisory board, you shut down. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I really want to get, I know you can't talk too much about um, some of the work you do uh, for obvious reasons, but... Um, I have heard stories of, uh, you know, within my industry of the tricks and games that go on uh, between uh, different forces of power, say the investors versus, you know, the board and, um, and management. Um, so really interested to hear sort of if you've heard any stories of things that have gone really badly and, and why um, and how that happened. You know, all the tricks that go on. Wow. Um... Yeah. Uh, the, you the talked about shadow that, directors. Yeah. Yeah. So when when there's multiple agendas, it's it's tricky. There's predatory practice that occurs in the startup scale up market where um, you're um, uh, presenting one thing, but there's actually a, another opportunity there. I think where. Where the uh, where it gets really tested is when you're trying to do multiple things with with the with the guise of one. Um, um, when you are combining being an investor and uh, an advisor, it can sometimes work. But when you're an investor and a chair, it's really tricky. I even I even messed up on that myself. Um, so I've made some really um, bad mistakes really well. <laughs> um, uh, so. Um, along the way in the learning early days where um, uh, where I was chairing an advisory board and then I became an investor and um, uh, in that business to get it ready for sale and I thought I was pretty good and, and um, pretty ethical but as soon as I was I was doing both roles we had the agenda in our meeting in front of us here and then I had this tricky little agenda in my head that popped up that I didn't even realize that would actually happen <laughs> so it's about, about saying it's going to be one or the other, right? So I, I think that's that's important. The accelerator and incubator space is is a is a really problematic area, I think, uh, because there are so many moving parts to it. Um, with our with the launch of the best practice framework in February this year, we've released a, a best practice guideline for accelerators and incubators uh, for for um, a program managers to be able to use and, and build um, uh, some really good ethics frameworks for an accelerator and an incubator, um, uh, some orientations for them so that there's some um, really good disclosure that occurs in those environments back to program managers without them getting caught up in the detail. Um, um, and I think this is a good time in the market for accelerators and incubators to really rethink the way that they are engaging their advisors and mentors in their programs and to put some some really simple frameworks but effective frameworks around that to to protect um, the the uh, both the enterprises and the advisors as well as the the hubs themselves um, uh, that that's where I see it's it's most problematic that's great um, yeah because I hear a lot about the the what I call the VC games that goes on, um, especially in in the US, and um, I hear from the, some of the people that that have been trampled by it. It's, it's pretty tragic. So I think um, the service you're offering is is maybe a good way to perhaps limit yeah. those downsides uh, if you're if you're a founder. So um, and it's yeah. really good. You mentioned some of your own mistakes. So um, that's that's it takes a lot of courage. <laughs> so that, that's great. Um, I try to always encourage that as well. So uh, get rid of my ego and uh, and leave that at the door. And I think your business does better for it. So um, yeah. Which brings me that, to that, another that question. Was, so yeah. you, you go yeah. ahead. No, no, so so just on that mistake 
Actually, um, uh, before we built the, the professional body, we had five years of researching and testing and validating the market because if it's in, this is a new sector, right? And so you don't know where those boundaries are until you actually go out there and test them. Um, um, and so you can't build a sector without actually understanding where those, where those boundaries are. No, that's, that's great. I mean, it's a very um, uh, sort of tech you know, growth thing where you probably not explain this very well, but you know, you put yourself out there, push the boundaries and then get the feedback and then improve and iterate on that process and get better and then formalize some kind of yeah. model from there. Hmm. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Um, so there's a bit of a Peter Thiel question, but uh, what's something about your discipline or your specialty that most people believe in currently, but which you know to be incorrect? Oh, run that question by me again. <laughs> so what is there something about your discipline or, you know, the thing that you do that a lot of people believe in, but which you know to be wrong? Oh, that people believe in, but it's wrong. So like, you know, uh, um, things around- that are generally accepted as truth, but which you've then found out to be actually incorrect. Yeah. It's a hard um, question. You don't have to answer it. but It is. Um, well, advisory boards is is it's not about the telling and purging my brilliance on somebody else. That's not what sitting on an advisory board is not about that. Some people like to think that I'm going to be on an advisory board because I can, I can tell you what you need to do. Um, it's um, being on an advisory board is actually a very humbling experience because it's not about you. It's about somebody else. It's about really thinking about what, what their world is is um and not projecting um uh, uh, projecting your own personal bias onto somebody else you've got to keep yourself in check um as as an as an advisor um and also keep yourself in check about what comes out of your mouth sometimes you just need to zip it <laughs> um and um and, and the areas of, of making sure that whatever comes out of my mouth it's been my direct experience and it's been my direct experience in the last five years. And I think the currency of being current is, is really important because in a time of accelerated change, you've got to think about, like, uh, I used to own a HR company, right? I'd be the last person you want to talk about HR right now because I, I don't know, you know, I'm not an expert in that area today because I haven't done it for a really long time. So when people come and ask me a HR question, you go, you really should be asking me that. Um, back and, and disclosing what I would do as a, as a fellow business owner but not as a professional. And I think you could be careful. Just because you've been asked the question doesn't necessarily mean that you, you should be providing the answer and being able to pull back. No, that's, that's great. Um, yeah, I find the same in my discipline as well. Like it's so dynamic that even what I was doing in May for one area of what I do has completely changed. You know, May 4th, I couldn't do that thing anymore. Bang. And uh, if I was you know, uh, using a playbook from 2014, 15 for growing startups, completely different to 2020. Um, so I think a lot of people, you know, read those books from successes of the past and there's this sort of innate bias that that will work again. And it's sometimes not the case, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Can you give me an example around that, John? Because that's, that's really interesting. That's really rapid change. Yeah. So um, I suppose with a lot of these um, digital platforms, um, and I've seen this because I do a lot of personal tests myself uh, on my own business and, and my clients. Um, so, you know, platforms like Facebook, Google, um, TikTok, uh, a lot of them have algorithms that run behind these systems that are updated. Um, even LinkedIn, uh, where, you know, I found out about the Advisory Broad Center, uh, recently had done some updates and it completely changes the nature of the dynamic of then how I would recommend people use that to achieve whatever goal they're trying to set. So my advice would completely change. And if I wasn't in there um, doing that or getting that sort of ground level feedback, I would be giving the wrong advice. Um, So it's so dynamic. And that's just one little example. Um, In terms of startups, there's um, the YC or Y Combinator um, series that was very famous in 2014, 15, uh, using a particular playbook to grow um, tech startups that... um, some of those recommendations and the mix you would use in, in that growth process would be very different now because the yield has changed so much from being quite a lucrative thing to do to maybe being hyper-competitive and low-yielding. Um, so that's just one example. Mm. 
but it's rapid. That is rapid change, and uh, it, it's a good demonstration of you've got to keep current, don't you? If you're yeah. providing advice to others, you, you've you've got to be on your on on your on your A game. I mean, that that's on a tactical level, though. I mean, I think the strategic process and advice that I would give would be very similar, mm. um, but a tactical level, completely different. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So you think about, you know, a business that's entering international markets, we say, to and, and businesses that are already in international markets now, but they can't get to their operations because they can't travel, right? Mm -hmm. So um, having, uh, if, if a business hasn't had direct experience from their, their board or their executive in that market, we say you should have an advisory board in that, in that, in that particular market to protect your asset. That's the kind of, you know, that, that kind of currency, I think it's, it's really, really relevant. No, that's great. Um, so what, like we've talked about some of the, the things you should avoid, right? Um, yeah. what about some of the funny things or uplifting things or success stories that you've experienced in, in, in your career and doing this advisory boards? Um, look, um, success things, uh, there's a few different levels, I guess there's the individual advisory boards themselves and now the advisory community. Um, uh, the, there, there are funny things that happen, but what I think has been interesting is a lot of fun things that happen in this space. It's a very optimistic environment. Advisory boards, which is so different to governance boards, where governance boards have to be so careful about what happened and validating what happened. And advisory boards is about what's next, what, what's going to happen. And it's very optimistic um, it's blue sky. It's a lot of energy involved in all of that. And so, what I love about this space is that it, it's it's about um, it's about the what's next um, and and exploring that and being able to explore it with a lot of different people and some of the finest minds in the market who are thought leaders to be able to capture that and having these really sophisticated yet humble conversations is really it, it's a lot of joy mm -hmm. that that goes with that. Yeah, the um, I loved being a, a, an advisory board chair that I did it for that five years while I was researching and testing it. And even when I was backpacking around the world, I was chairing advisory boards uh, back here in Australia via Skype in the middle of the night and all those sorts of things that you do. <laughs> so um, you were backpacking was, was, and doing advisory board work. <laughs> Where were you backpacking? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. When I sold my business, I backpacked around. I, just packed up everything and, and travelled for two and a half years. So 13 and a half kilos was my life. And I was chairing a bike board back here in Australia. So do you realise I'm backpacking? I go, yeah, that's all right. You just, just do what you do. And, and when, I, when I was travelling, I'm not a great tourist. So um, while I was travelling, I did a research project on 430 consulting firms in 17 countries um, uh, to really understand what's going on in the consulting market while I was chairing and testing advisory boards as well to see where is that mix and where, does, where do they work together and where, where they don't. I think I've got uh, so a new book title great, for you. Um, just, just before we go on, I think, um, Louise, uh, the backpacking advisor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was just, it's just absolutely wonderful, you know? Uh, and so I, I'd, I'd be interviewing somebody saying, we've got a consulting firm, um, and we're, we're in, uh, in, in a certain, um, uh, one, I, I was in Spain and, and, uh, I got a firm from South Africa calling me saying, oh, we're really interested in, you know, being involved in your research and, and what you're doing. And, and I said, you free next week. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and I flew to South Africa and went, and I ended up spending three months there, which was, <laughs> which was fantastic. So wow. it was, it's, um, uh, yeah, it's, you don't need walls around you. And I think everybody's sort of experiencing that now to be able to be really effective um, um, in your professional, but, but also remember to be a human being at the same time. Um, did you, um, did yeah. you do the El Camino? No, I wanted, I, I, I would like to do that. I had a motorbike accident a few years ago, so I can't carry a backpack like I used to. Um, so I'd need to have, you know, I'd have to do a fat cat walk with someone take, carrying a pack for me. <laughs> <Meet some service. laughs> yeah, it's it. <laughs> that sounds pretty good. I, I, that, that's still on my list. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Um, so uh, I suppose that's the end of the sort of formal questions. Um, I've got a couple of standard things yeah. that I ask every guest. Um, so uh, I'm, you know, in lockdown, I, I went to a bookstore, which I haven't done in like, I don't know, 10 years or more and, and yeah. bought a physical book at a store or arranged them. I've been reading them. So um, anything that you're reading now or have read in the past that you'd strongly recommend um, the listeners today to, to read? 
Yeah. Um, with, um, uh, with, with the lockdown thing that happened in March, I gave uh, my team a, a voucher for office work so they can set themselves up at home. <clears throat> and I, um, I thought um, I, I, I bought myself the dummies book to Excel so I could finally learn how to do pivot tables. <laughs> 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 so um, we're now at the other end of it and, and I, I, I haven't read it. <laughs> So that's on, that's on my to-do list. So I still can't do pivot table. So um, someone give me a quick test on that. That'd be awesome. But, <laughs> but there are two books that I, I just so happen to have them here and probably two ends of the spectrum. Um, we've been rethinking our 2025 strategy and um, and one of the books that um, that really were a lot of aha moments for me was Think Like Amazon, uh, John Rossman. It is a pretty cool book. Um, so... Um, I got a lot out of it. I've destroyed the book. Everything's underlined and earmarked. And that's a sign <laughs> no, of a good book. <laughs> it is, yeah. I love a book that's got a broken spine because you know it's been loved. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's, that's the one book. And the other book that a very good friend of mine, Sandy Deans, gave me is the Dr. Zeus book, The Oh, The Places You Could Go. <laughs> <laughs> is this like it's a business a cool. analogy I don't know about or...? No, no it, look, it, it, apparently it's the number one um, a gift for people when they graduate um, uh, from university. So um, uh, it's, a, it's a very good, very good book. So um, I thought there was this, uh, this hidden metaphor, like, you know, the, the book uh, uh, Our Iceberg is Melting with the Penguins, and it's like a, a massive metaphor on business solving and teamwork and management. Yeah, I'm going to write that one down. <laughs> uh, I think it's called Our uh, Iceberg is Melting. Um, you just Google that. I'll put, I'll put the links in the, in the comments. But really interesting book. And basically yeah. there's these penguins on this iceberg and one of the penguins goes, oh, I think, I think we've got a melting issue in the core of our iceberg because no one can see it and it's just a hypothesis. Um, then everyone doesn't believe him. And then it's the story basically. I don't want to ruin the ending, but it, it moves from one place and then how here next change gets other people into the idea and then testing hypothesis and then um, getting buy-in from different parties to then change the thought process of this herd of penguins that are stuck in this iceberg and whether they should stay on the iceberg or go to a new iceberg. (laughs) Can I ask, did the the penguins form an advisory board? (laughs) I don't want to ruin the ending, but sort of, sort of, you would say. Pretty much. There was a formal structure of three or four or five penguins, I think, all with different disciplines, all with different knowledges, and they're all working together to solve this problem. And so it's, it's actually a fascinating book to read. Um, it's a bit, I think it was popular in the 80s or 90s, and my sister put me onto it, actually. And uh, it was just a fascinating read. Um, so yeah, I think to wrap a, a boring topic into a, into a, a novel and a narrative is, is a skill. And I think they did it really well. Yeah, fantastic. That's great. Um, so, I'm going to so, read that. Book. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, and it's it's very tattered and lots of stuff underlined as me, as well for me. Uh, a lot of practical takeaways if you're a manager, for example. Um, favorite yeah. websites that that you that are your go tos. Um, anything that you're always visiting? Uh, Advisorboardcenter.com.au. <laughs> <laughs> That's the next question. That's the plug. <laughs> Okay, maybe apart from that, just to like um, increase your, I don't know, entertains you or increases your business knowledge or? Um. Uh, I, I don't have one. The problem with um, oh, when you Google things, you become a rabbit down a hole, don't you? You just mm. end up having this whole web. I, I guess the World, World Health Organization's got a few hits from me in the, in the last few months. Uh, I've, I've actually stopped stopped looking at it at it now. Um, um, <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I, I can't say, um, no, I, I can't say any besides myself. Isn't that really, that's really egotistical. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's, a, it's probably a good sign. You've freed yourself from online distractions. I know a lot of people that do a digital detox and turn off all the notifications of social media and, and they get a lot yeah. more done. So maybe you're just very yeah. efficient with your time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty focused. <laughs> Good. What about a piece of tech that you can't do without? Like, could be software or hardware. What's your sort of your favourite thing? Um, look, um, uh, like everybody else, Zoom has been uh, a bit of a lifesaver. I've always used Zoom in the last few years. Before that was Skype. If, um, uh, uh, when I was uh, backpacking and, and and using that, then Zoom didn't exist then. Um, uh, but Zoom has been. Um, 
I, I guess like everybody, in a really a far, a highly effective um, a way of uh, connecting because we have uh, a global advisory community. Um, uh, we, we've uh, our online presence in the way that we digitally connecting with each other is just so important about it's not about connections it's about relationships um and and zoom is the next best thing i guess um or any of these kinds of platforms uh to be able to meet like this um and still be able to create relationships um so it's been an absolute um, must for us for our um for us to really we've shifted our business model a lot um, in the last last three months, um, and and th that this technology has been absolutely a must for that. Well, we're using Zoom right now as well to record this. So um, if anyone complains about the audio dropping in yeah. and out or, or whatever, uh, it's not my fault. It's uh, <laughs> you can blame Zoom or my internet connection. <laughs> um, what about? Um, I, I think you know there's some really good things that you mentioned in here. Um, uh, what's the best way for people to contact you if they just want to ask you a question or something without, uh, I know you're a very busy woman because um, you're very good at what you do, but um, say someone's a bit of a fan of what they hear, what's what's the best way to get in, in touch? Yeah, connecting via, via LinkedIn um, for sure. Um, if, if people are interested in uh, the best practice framework, that's, that's, um, that is uh, open source to everybody. Um, I think if anyone's interested in either being an advisor or having an advisory board for a business, we want we want people to think good on you for for giving it a go. That that best practice framework is available for everyone. So download that off 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 the website um, as well. It's a good resource. That's great. And talking about uh, just to finish challenging my own biases, um, I did my interview list and. Um, when I wanted to start this podcast, right? And uh, it was like, I went through and reviewed it all. It was just all guys. Um, so I, I challenged my own biases and I said, look, I know lots of very good women who are very good at what they do and I want to interview them. So then um, I found out and and networked with, um, I went to you and went to Jan, who put me onto you and, and other really good women in the space. And um, is there anyone else you would recommend uh, that I should perhaps talk to next? Not necessarily about advisory boards, but um, just in general. Oh, 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 look, I've got a list. <laughs> I've got a whole list. So, um, uh, what what is it that you want to? What, what are you curious about? It's around uh, growth of businesses, strategy, um, maybe with a bit of edge of tech or a new approaches um, to growing businesses and making them successful, or or peak performance of people within businesses. Mm. Yeah. Look, there's there's a, there's a whole list of um, both businesses as well as advisors and advisors who are business owners as well. That are everyone's got their own story, haven't they? Um, well, uh, actually, I forgot to ask you this question too. Maybe you can. I'm sure you'll email me some some uh, names if you if you don't mind uh, that yeah. I could perhaps approach. But yeah. um, what about talking about diversity on boards as well? Like having representation. You talked about specialists yeah. um, who have skin in the game within their discipline who may be really good at advice there, but have blind spots in other mm -hmm. areas um what about mm -hmm. diversity ratio on boards like we're talking about um gender as well as perhaps um uh racial backgrounds or, or experience yeah yeah um <clears throat> that's interesting we, we've been doing a little bit of work with sbs recently around diverse perspectives so it's not necessarily about diversity where that can sometimes gets just channeled into men and women and, and mm -hmm. race but it's about diverse perspectives um and it's also an ageist thing too. Um, uh, uh, you get a, a lot of uh, younger people that are fantastic advisors that are sharp and really current on certain things, and you get older advisors too that uh, um, add a lot of value as well. And, and both ends of those spectrums also um, 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 potentially get uh, dismissed. Um, so. Uh, yeah, like the chair of my advisory board is thirty five, right? And so, just just awesome perspective. Um, so, uh, the the thing that we did with SBS was around diverse perspectives. Around um, we think that some of the businesses that are going to really thrive in the uptake after COVID are businesses that are <clears throat> driven by immigrants um, and as well as refugees because they understand complexity. They understand. Um, 
having to um, pull a rabbit out of a hat, you know, doing a lot with nothing. Um, uh, so I, I think, you know, those those businesses were going to learn a lot from the, the businesses that, have, that are immigrants and, and, and refugees, as well as advisors that have come from that background as well. Um, but I think that group too also have deep connections in international markets with family and and colleagues as well. So that potentially people, when we are in a lockdown type scenario, that are going to be really useful for global um, operations. So I'd, I'd say that kind of, um, if you really look looking at, at really perspectives uh, from immigration and refugee um, um, in, environments, I think that would be um, that would be a really worthwhile story to tell. Well, that's great. I think that's a great note to finish on. So, um, yeah, thanks very much. I think there's a really good conversation. Um, lots in there that, that I'm going to ponder and I'm going to read the books you mentioned, and perhaps you'll be reading about <laughs> icebergs. <laughs> pretty <Yeah. soon. laughs> Um, and yeah, I just want to thank you for your time because I know you're very busy and, um, really big fan of, of what you're doing over there at the advisory board center. So, uh, thanks again and I'll let you enjoy the rest of your morning. Yeah. Likewise. See you soon.